This conversation with Jordan is just one of those conversations that will inspire you to live life to your fullest. You'll hear what Jordan decided to do with his company after he was diagnosed with cancer. You'll also hear some of his daily practices of what he uses to stay positive, have a clear mind with all the challenges he faces. And you'll, he even reads an excerpt from his personal journal, that and much more. Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Jordan. Jordan is the founder of Molding Box, which is a logistics and transportation company. Just to tell you a little bit about the company, it's grown to a multi-million dollar a year company. It's gained several recognitions over the years. The Inc. 500, it was number 71 in 2009, 938 in 2010, and he actually started it in his mom's basement in 2006. He was nominated twice for the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. In April 2012, Jordan was diagnosed with stage three melanoma, and he looks at cancer as the best thing that ever happened to him. Uh, thanks for joining us, Jordan. Of course, no problem. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. No, Jordan, you know, I'm really excited to talk to you because you know, our audience wants to know how they can overcome personal and business challenges. You know, a lot of times we have a lot of things stopping us and what we really want out of life. And so I want to hear from you because you're, you know, you've done it and you're doing it. And mm -hmm. before we go into some of those things you can instill on us, um, I like to include a fun fact. So a fun fact about Jordan is uh, he used to be an amateur ballroom dancer and was actually number one in the world at one of those dances. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, so I, I went to college, actually. It's kind of funny. When I, when I graduated high school, I actually, I, well, I got kicked out of high school, which is kind of a, a whole other story. But I, I, I left high school and started dancing for, uh, for a company here and eventually ended up going to college and, and got a full ride scholarship for it as well. I didn't wow. even know they had scholarships for dancing. But yeah, from there, just kind of, you know, we, we became, we, we, I just spent a lot of time doing it and really, really, really fell in love with it. Like it was, in high school, I used to play football. I, w I was a skateboarder. I was a pothead. And, you know, I kind of looked at it and it finally, I, I went and tried out with my sister and realized there's a lot hotter girls in, in ballroom than there are in football. And so I knew there was a girl. I knew there was like a girl angle there because there was two things. I wouldn't expect one, you'd get kicked out of high school. And two, I wouldn't look at you and be like, that's a ballroom dancer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're pretty girls. There's, there's much more scantily clad women in ballroom than there are in football. Football. So I kind of I kind of made that decision and just Got decided like, I'm never gonna I'm, I wasn't big enough for football and we I've been some tiny like four A three A school here that's never gonna do anything football wise but ballroom led to led to much broader and bigger things I mean I was able to travel the world with the ballroom team and you know won all sorts of awards with it so it's been it's been awesome but yeah it's definitely a fact that when when people first meet me and kind of they. They'd known me over the last, you know, five, six years where it's all business and all, you know, like with the with health and everything like that. Like ballroom such a random thing and it seems it seems like a lifetime ago. <laughs> but you know, you probably bring some of those habits and things you did, you know, in discipline and ballroom to your business and also, you know, those habits and overcoming some of these personal challenges and business challenges. So before we get started with some of the advice you have, could you tell us go back to one of those emotional low points in yeah. the past. So when I so like like you had mentioned, I mean, in April of last year, I had um, a surgery on my my neck here. Um, they, I had some lymph nodes that kind of swelled up and everything like that. And it actually happened on on 420, which was like a sad day for me because it's Bob Marley's birthday and everything like that. So I, I they got it, you know, cut out everything like that. And then on 425, I, I went back to the doctor and he kind of he gave me the you know like, well, you have cancer, you know. Kind of looked at him like, well. You know, thanks, I guess. I don't know what to say. So kind of left. And, you know, a few days after that, I was, I was just driving around and had a lot on my mind, obviously. And, and so was, yeah. let's go back to that moment for a second. Uh -huh. Yeah, of course. I mean, did they just say just a matter of fact and then you just kind of walked out of there or was there more of like an emotion around it? No. So I'm, if you talk to my wife or anyone, it's it's it, it was I'm, I'm a very I've always been very even level. Like I, it takes a lot to get a rise out of me either way. And literally, he walked into the doctor's office. He sat down. He said, "Jordan, I'm I'm really sorry, but you have cancer." And my first response was, "Well, you don't have to be sorry. You did nothing about it. You know, thank you for your sympathy, but you know, what do we do now?" And that that was about it. Like that was the only emotional like up chick or anything like that that happened at that moment in time. It wasn't. It wasn't like I I don't know if it just didn't hit me at that point in time, or I really like really thinking about it like. 
it, it hit me, but I didn't, it didn't shock me, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a major thing, but it wasn't until a few days later that when I was just driving around and really, really had time to think and really had time to, you know, kind of, kind of look at, at what was going on and, and I guess give myself that pity. Um, I have a sister that, that also has bipolar disease and it was, and it was at the same time that I, I was really just thinking about her and I really started to empathize with her and really started to feel what it would be like to, to be almost that hopelessness, you know, the, the, the loss there and everything like that. And then I started to look at like my family and say like, well, you know, I could really die from this. This could be something that, that is the end of me at the end of, you know, this reality or whatever it was. And I really felt more sad of like not being there for my kids and not being there for, to support my wife and, and to be there with my family, but for myself, like, you know, it, it really was the best, absolutely the best thing that ever happened to me. A, it, it made me know that I'm going to die, which made me switch my priorities and really look at life and say, what do I actually care about? Why am I, why am I doing things for other people? Why am I doing things that I'm not being fulfilled? Why am I doing things that for some expectation that someone's holding me up to? It really made me switch all of that and really look at it and say, if, if this is it, if this is the end, if this is what's going to happen, why am I doing this, you know? And yeah, and I think that the more the sadness and the, and the pity and stuff was, was just like, I didn't, you know, I don't blame God and I don't blame anything. I blame myself for everything. You know, I'm really internal of saying, you know, it happened to me. It didn't just pop up overnight. It's a lot of stuff that I did to get to this point that I don't feel bad for me. I, I really just felt bad for like the family and the, and the, the group of people I was associated with, Molding Box, with, you know, everything that was relying on me was really kind of that like that weight that really was the, that was probably the lowest point of you know that was the first time I'd cried and I don't even know how long you know like I actually just had to like pull over to the side of the road and just really had that you know like that just that, that devastation release. yeah like go over me but you know it, you know it was like a 10 minute thing then after that I'm like all right fuck it I gotta keep going and you know we gotta just kind of you know get through this and right. kind of from there so well, well you know that's well, what we'll get into is you know how you maintain such a happy positive disposition how you get over those low points because we all have those challenging low points uh-huh. um but what was one of the proudest before we get into some of those what's one of the proudest moments you've had um I, i'd say there's it's kind of twofold one of the proudest moments i've had is is like the birth of my son was awesome like one of the coolest things ever like i have i have a four-year-old daughter and i have a seven-month-old son and uh, the, the the funny the funny story about the labor and delivery is i, I passed out during it like that, literally, they like they they gave my wife an IV, and like the the lady, like all this blood came out everywhere, and I was like, oh, like fell over. And I'm I'm sitting there on the ground, and I wake up, and I look up, and I'm just like, man, I'm that guy. Like, how did I become that guy? Well, you know, like so that that whole like you know the the so that's the background, you know, the story. And then then when my boy was born, like actually being there and actually be able to spend the time and and able to see him come out and, and really appreciate that and with a whole new different set of glasses you know because it was after after the after I was diagnosed after everything like that that I was able to come and actually actually go through and see all that stuff was was really just awesome for me and, and yeah it was it was a definitely proud moment on the family side on the business side I think the proudest moment was actually being able to to let go of molding box I, I hired a CEO a while ago and and actually like that that true like letting go of it was probably the proudest mummy moment on the professional side I felt like I I lost a child but gained a child at the same time so it was it was really both proud moments for sure so tell me about how you came to the position you know the uh, decision to fire yourself because it's not an easy decision is your baby you started in your mom's basement mm-hmm it, it really came down to, well, I, I was kind of forced into it. And this is why, again, cancer is the greatest thing ever is, you know, it, 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 when, when I, back in July of last year is when I went, I went through, radi- so I went through 20 days of radiation and then I went through a week of chemotherapy that I was in the hospital, like down, down and out for a long time. And so really I was forced to make a decision to, to kind of back out. And originally I, I just kind of walked away originally because I had to, you know, I, I found out. Um, I just kind of stopped going in and just told the people that were there at that point in time, hey, you know what, you guys got to run with it. I think I've set everything up and, and, you know, good luck more or less. And, you know, went through, went through radiation, tried to go into the office a few days and just, just couldn't do it. Um, started to see that, you know, there, there wasn't as much structure as I thought. A lot, of the, a lot of the company was still relying on me. And so from there, started looking at what we had in place found our operations director was just doing a fantastic job 
and you know kind of spent some time talking with him and eventually kind of got to that point where he was doing such great things that were way beyond my 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 wildest dreams you know i i thought about things like what he was implementing but he was actually implementing it that you know just kind of it just made way more sense to hire or promote him and let go of myself because i, I really realized that it was just me hindering myself it was you know i would i would talk about you know oh, we got to get metrics we got to get you know um, start to start tracking X, Y, and Z, whatever it was, and you know I would never implement that. I would never go in and actually do that. I would talk about them, but me being the CEO was like that's below me. I can't do that stuff. You know, someone else should do that. And I'd always live in this vague world of shoulds and shouldn'ts and must and could and everything like that, where I saw my operations guy really executing and doing those things. And so by the time I hired him and really really put him into that that CEO role. It, it was one of those things where the first like week I was I was like well you know it's gonna take a little while to get you there then after the first week I'm like well I'm an idiot I don't even know why I'm trying to direct you to do anything just go like you are awesome just run with it and I'm just here to support and so you know we we, we say in molding box we have we, we believe in one thing and that's unleashing potential you know we're not in it to make money we don't care about that stuff we're not in it to you know for fame and fortune we're in it to unleash potential we believe that the human potential in everyone is is so untapped that if we just focus on tapping that we'll be successful and and with my ceo i mean that he's just amazing like absolutely amazing and so it's been it, it's the literally that the being able to just really walk away and know that the company's in in the best hands it could possibly be in was just amazing so I wanted to talk yeah. about some of those, how you overcame some of the low points. But first, you talked about you know the company about unleashing potential. When you were there, what's one thing? Because obviously, more people want to unleash the potential in their current staff or mm -hmm. friends or family or whoever. What's one thing you do you did at the company that you found really worked to help unleash the potential of some of this the staff? Well, some of the things that we do um, with. So, like, we have we have three areas of focus. You know, we say our impact, our clients, and our employees. And you know, our clients is to reach those we hadn't reached before. Our our impact is to be a leader and a beacon for good. And our employees is to set people up to win in life. So, what what you know, some specific things we did is like core values. You know, just coming up with those core you know four or five values. Ours are four. You know, integrity, honesty, accountability, and communication. Um, and then from that we those are that was basically our baseline and then from that we just started building upon those those very small things so like one thing we do is w there's this book that Vern Harnish wrote called Mastering the Rockefeller Habits and it talks about priorities and rhythms and alignment and so we started implementing that with molding box of just saying you know how do we get the best out of people as we support them through you know telling them where they're going telling them what we expect from them, getting what they expect from us, and then holding everyone accountable and then communicating through it and saying, you know, okay, well, you're going to do this. We're going to help you by doing this. And let's talk about those every single day. And let's make sure that we're on the same page here. And let's make sure that we're walking forward every single day and, and making progress. You know, we always say it's progress, not perfection either. We're not looking for something perfect. We're just looking for it to move forward. We're just looking for it to take that tiny, tiny baby step, and that that's all we really need out of out of the company, you know. And it's it's those constant rhythms. It's the daily things that are we're always checking in with our employees. We're always trying to get the best out of them. We're always asking them what what they need for support. You know, it's a, it's a big family. You know, a business isn't a business isn't some you know great. There's a business now. It's just going to run. A business is just a bunch of people doing the same thing over and over again. And we just kind of realized that and we, we, we let, our, what, let our employees realize that and told our employees, hey, you're part of this. If it's not for you, why are we doing this? You know, if it's, not, if it's not benefiting you, who cares about the money? Who cares about the client? Who cares about all that stuff? If it doesn't help our employees, why are we in it? You know, because we don't want people to come to work and hate their jobs, you know. That's one thing that I, I think that that molding box kept that I really enjoy that I've did. I've done a lot of I'm glad they got rid of a lot of the things that I was doing, but some of the few things they did keep is like that the focus on the employee, on 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 the fun environment, on the getting a place that I would want to go to work, you know, a place that I would want to go and have a good time at. Mm -hmm. And and we've really instilled that with the culture of the company. Well what's one thing so obviously you're running a successful company. What's one thing you saw they get rid of that you're like, oh yeah, I should have got rid of that long ago? 
my jumping around a lot. <laughs> my, we, we call it the squirrel syndrome. So, or have you seen a, up, the movie Up where the little dog sees the squirrel and always like turns his head? Yeah. So I, I would always do that. You know, I'd always look for the BBD. I'd say, oh, great. This is awesome right now because of X, Y, and Z. Until I get bored of it, and then I jump somewhere else, and then I do that until I got bored of it, and then I jump somewhere else, and eventually it just never progressed anywhere, and never really did anything. Um, so that you know that the focus of everything was was huge. And then another thing was I would I would always I would always look at employees as as friends, but I wouldn't look at it as friends and an employee relationship or employee-employee relationship. So you can have both. You can still be friends with your employees and still hold them accountable. I, I, w I was always terrible at holding people accountable because I would always just, I would never set expectations up front. I'd never tell people what I expected of them and I would never let them know what they should expect of me. And so those mutual expectations up front were never in place. So when something happened that I felt was wrong, well, how am I supposed to go back to an employee and tell them they did something wrong when I never gave them direction in the first place? And so a lot of those things, they just started clearing out and really actually like living to our core values of actually communicating with each other, actually holding people accountable and not just having those on the wall saying, yeah, those are our core values, but really living those values, um, I think were, were some of the things that they, that I wasn't doing, that they really started implementing now that have been fantastic, absolutely yeah. fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things like you have it on the wall, you know it, but it's much, much harder to actually implement it and do it on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, so tell us about how did you overcome some of those low points? Can you tell us maybe when you drove into the office for the last time? Yeah. So so one of the one of the most powerful things I've ever ever did of like you know when when I was going through through everything I was going through and kind of kind of the the craziness that was happening, I had a lot of just turmoil in my mind of of you know well what should I do? What what's the right thing? What what's the answer? What's the question? What is all this stuff? And I had listened to, I believe it was, uh, oh, it was, it was this guy Brian Johnson. He does philosopher's notes. Um, I don't recall the exact note, but in there, um, he they talked about acceptance and they talked about love and 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 self acceptance. And so one of the things while I was driving to the office one day, I was listening to this and it just popped up again. You know, I'd heard it throughout a lot of notes, and it finally just it finally just dawned on me like. You know, you gotta accept yourself. You gotta do this. And so, on my way to the office, I looked into my rearview mirror and I just I looked myself in the eye for the first time in years and just said, you know, I love and accept you. And and it was just one of the most powerful things I'd ever done in my life of just just actually realizing that, hey, there, with with everyone else in this world can go away, but it's only me and you. You know, just looking at myself in the mirror and it's only it's only me and I I need to accept myself. And so when I did that, it kind of set me on that journey of saying. I can do this. What am I going to do? What are, where am I going to you know move forward and stuff? And 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 some of the things that kind of helped along that is one of my friends, uh, Alex, sent me a book um, right after I got done with radiation and it started chemo called the China Study and it and it really it kind of went in and and kind of gave some scientific explanation on you know why cancer happens and why disease happens and stuff like that. And from that book, it, it kind of set me down a path. To really, really start questioning myself, and and it really kind of opened my eyes to say, well, if I don't know about this, and it's something that I thought I knew about, what do I really know? You know, what do I know about life in general? What do I know about you know anything? And it it's, it, it was kind of it was kind of one of those like kicking the ass, and then also like I'm an idiot because my wife, you know, when I first originally was diagnosed, my wife started talking about like you know diet, nutrition, and and different things. I would always say, ah, it's just crazy Mexican voodoo because you know she'd hear from her you know Mexican relatives and everything like that. And like now I'm kind of eating my own words because I'm like, well, yeah, you were right about this crap and all this stuff. So it was you know they always say like your wife's always right, right? But, you know, that's I was lying to myself about that. That's a healthy marriage. That's all you have to know is. Your wife is right. That's right. <laughs> well, well, yeah, yeah, so, go ahead. Go oh, I was just going to say, yeah, that, was, that was probably the, the one, one of the main things was just that acceptance of myself, which started me on that path to know I trust myself with what I'm going to do. I trust myself with, with anything I do is going to be going in the right direction, you know. So what about, how do you overcome or what do you think about when you are going through that radiation, the treatment, and, you know, you're a healthy guy, you're, you know, uh, number one in the world at like a ballroom dancing and, you know, you're running a successful business and then you're down and out and you can't go into work and you're too fatigued. How do you get your mindset around that? Well, what I do is I, I kind of implemented some daily practices. 
So like some of the things that I, I started doing is just like meditation. I had heard from someone that, oh, meditation was great, and it's, oh, my kids, if you can hear my kid in the background, he's being a little crazy, sorry about that. Um, but, you have to but get him on like, camera at the end and say hello. Oh, but, yeah. Yeah. He's awesome. So I'll, give you my, I'll show you my daughter too. But, you know, just, just those daily practices of just the, the, the actual practicing being excellent and practicing being awesome and stuff like that. So, like, one of the things is, like I said, like daily, daily meditation. I only started out with, like, 30 seconds the first time because, like, my, my mind was going so crazy. But I just consistently kept at it. And I consistently, you know, drew that out from 30 seconds to 5 minutes to 15 minutes to now I do an hour a day every single morning. I, I do meditation just to center myself and really, really, you know, be, be in touch with what I'm really feeling and what I'm really thinking and, and, and what, what is really going on emotionally, what is really going on mentally, what is really going on physically because, you know, before meditation, I'd always just kind of like go through the day and, and feel and be like, oh, no, everything's fine, blah, blah, blah. Let me, let me distract myself with a, a million different objects. Let me distract myself with work. Let me distract myself with whatever it is. And actually being able to sit down and, and really focus has really helped me realize that, you know, there's much more to life than just, just the dollar. There's much more to this reality than we even know. You know, there's much more to, to just everything, you know, than, than, than what, we, what we assume. And so just the, the daily, you know, those rhythms and everything like that. And then along with that, I started journaling as well. So my wife got me a journal back in June, I think, right after, right, right before radiation. And so I just started writing in it, you know, just anything. Like I didn't have a, I didn't originally have a, um, what is it, like a, a format or anything. Actually, I'll, I'll read you what my, I'll see what my first journal entry was just to kind of give you like, I came from, I think, a day two of radiation this morning. I, I felt it, it as if, you know, little bits of, you know, like, like I felt like I was being sandblasted almost, like when it was coming through. And so I just wrote, you know, like my, my experience and stuff like that. And then from there, I, like now what I do, and that was, you know, June of last year. And now what I do is, I do a gratitude journal every single morning. I just write what I'm thankful for because it really sets my mind to say, you know, like, yeah, yeah, you know, the world is, people think the world's hard and all this stuff, but it's only because of, you think that way. I just decided to think differently and it took me a year to, to change that entire mindset to thanking for waking up, thankful for my family, thankful for, you know, the day and, and the beauty and everything that's around and it's really just, it makes me happy, you know, it, it, it makes me happy when I focus on the things I'm thankful for versus sad when I focus on the things that I don't like. So it's just, you know, the, I think meditation, the, the, you know, the journaling, the, like exercising, I, I ran two half marathons, I'd never run before in my life and, and literally I, I finished uh, half marathon three weeks ago and then my first half marathon another like five weeks ago because I just you know someone challenged me to do it and I, I started saying yes to things you know instead of saying no and making up all these excuses I said oh yeah hell, you know I, it's only life like I might as well do it so you know just started exercising and training and again like when I first started running it wasn't even running like I was I had gone through chemo I'd gone through radiation and I was exhausted I'd walk you know like 30 feet and I'd be out of breath just because my body couldn't handle it right and I'd go around my block and my block was weak like it was like a half block you know like maybe maybe a quarter mile and I just I was exhausted by the time I got home yeah. but from that just just slowly incrementally you know made an extra effort to make two more steps that day to go around my cul-de-sac when I got home to go around my neighborhood when I got home and slowly built upon that to okay I'm running a half marathon okay I'm running another half marathon within two weeks of that okay now you know my next plan's a marathon and then an ultra marathon and it's just those 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 slow practices you know it's not mm -hmm. there's no you know there's no big like oh you know all of a sudden everything's magic and it's a miracle it's changed it's all incremental yeah. you know it's all, it's all they say the journey of a thousand you know miles starts with the first footstep and I never really realized what that really meant because I was always trying to find footstep number 12 or footstep number 950 or footstep number, you know, 60 or whatever. But I never looked at number one, which was all it was, was taking that first step. And all it was, was that mentality to say, no, I'm not going to be sad today. No, I'm going to look at the choices I have when, when the situation comes. I'm going to look at the choice and say, I know I want to get somewhere. Is this getting me closer or is it not? And if it's getting me closer, I'm just going to decide to do that. And if it's not, I'm just not going to do it. And, you know, the, it, it's the same way of like the positive and negative thinking, you know, is positivity getting me closer to where I want to be or not? And it is, you know, so I, and it's so much easier if you're happy going through life than trying to be negative and beat yourself up and, 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 you know, like dwell in all these, you know, the, oh shit, I got cancer. And I could, I could dwell on that all day. And I could say that, you know, my life sucks and I could do all that stuff, but why? 
it only hurts me. It doesn't. It doesn't hurt anyone else. It doesn't help me at all. That I'd much rather just say, you know, I'd much rather just be happy about it and, and move on. You know, this is life is the only thing you really have, and it's the only thing that that there is. So why complain about it? You know, it, it just it, it just is. So there's no point complaining. Yeah. So it sounds like some of the you know, the way you overcome some of the low points and challenges is I wrote down is. You know, the meditation basically allows you to focus on what's important and also just having those small goals just mm -hmm. one step at a time, whether it's with business or, you know, running or whatever it is. Um, and also uh, what you were saying with um, what was it you were saying with um, just being positive. So have a gratitude, have a journal and just write the things you are grateful for, because sometimes it's hard under those circumstances. You know, it's it's easier said than done to think positive and do those things. So yeah, I like that. Just get a journal journal and then have something that you write down what you're grateful for. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to say going along with that. I mean, it's, it seems, you know, it, it definitely is that like, you know, how do you eat an elephant? It's all about one bite at a time, you know, and it's, and, and I, I know when when I was going through it, I always would judge myself against someone else, you know, and say, well, I'm not writing, I'm not grateful enough because Jesus was more grateful than me, or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever it was gonna be. Um, but one of the one of the big things that that really really helped is is asking myself, what do I want? Because I was so lost, you know, where you know, Alice in Wonderland, the Cheshire Cat always says, you know, um, if you don't know where you're going, any path will take you there. And so the first, very first step that I found was just asking myself, what do I want out of life? You know, what do I really want? And so once I, once I defined that for me, and, and for me it was like, you know, I want, I want happiness. I want joy. I want love. I want to be loved. Like, that's what I, I just want that. Once I define what I want, I don't need to worry about getting there anymore. I just need to know that's the direction I'm heading and then I can start down that path. And it may not, I may not know what the path looks like, and I, I'm not gonna know what it's gonna look like in tomorrow or a year from now or anything, but I'm not worried about that because I know I'm going towards something. And you know, life is about the journey, and I know that this path is taking me closer and closer to, to that, that it's just, it's just so much funner that way because you know, if, I've, I've seen so many people that, that get, you know, they, they just don't know what they want, so they try everything, and then they get stuck in the negative thing because they're not getting anywhere, but they're not, trying to get anywhere so they're exactly where they're they're going to be unless they you know actually take that step forward and so i think that the very first question i would always ask is what do i want you know and then then the quick follow-up is why do i want it you know yeah yeah i like that and and i think that's what everyone wants right they want happiness they want to be loved i mean maybe you know you you said it explicitly but you know it's something that most people are probably you know underlying that's what they want um yeah. So what's going to some of the, the milestones you were able to achieve because you've done these things, because you, you know, you journal and because you meditate and fighting through some of the challenges when you stepped away from the CEO position, what was one example, one thing you saw when the CEO took over and how he stepped it up so that you were kind of able to do your own thing, relax and heal? Yeah, one one of the things that honestly it came down to like the Rockefeller habits is, was the greatest thing in the world. That book is amazing. I w I literally like I have like five copies here. So like anyone that ever talks to me about business, I'm just like read this. Like just read this because it, what it what it is is like you know it, the scariest thing about like letting go, and I think a lot of owners have or founders have of like letting go is like it's not going to be done correctly. They're not going to do what I want. They're going to do their own thing. Well, the only reason they would do that is because you didn't tell them what you wanted. And you didn't set it out and you didn't say, these are the things I expect. Here's what we're going through. This is what, you know, how I'm going to know you're doing your job, how you're going to know I'm doing my job. And, and honestly, like that Rockefeller book, like for us, it really just lined it out. And we set the goals like here are the four, five priorities that we need to hit. And if we don't hit these, I'm not doing my job. You're not doing your job. And, you know, here's the here's how we know on a daily basis what we're doing. And, and so I like for me, I do like a daily rhythm with my CEO. And it's and just actually like this next week, I'm switching it to like weekly rhythms because we've gotten we've gotten to the point where we don't need to meet daily because he knows how I feel. But in the beginning, it was, you know, like every single day we'd, we'd hop on the phone and we just say, hey, here's our goals. Here's the five things we want to accomplish. What are you doing today to get there? What did you do yesterday to get there? Great, what are you doing tomorrow? Awesome, well tomorrow I'm gonna to follow up and say, hey, yesterday you told me these things. Did you accomplish that? Yes. And you know, I think a lot of people are afraid because they, they think, 
I want someone exactly like me. I want my clone. I want to be able to, to replace me with me, so me goes and does that. But that's not the best way to do it. The best way is to say, here's the, here's the things I want to, this business to do. Now, someone else go and do that for me. And guess what? If, if I just know what I want, and I know the, the measurement against that, well, then there's no risk. There's no worry. There's no fear. There's no any of that because I defined what I want and I'm holding him accountable to those things and he's holding himself accountable to that. And by the way, my CEO now knows what he's being held accountable to. So he's comfortable in his job. He's secure because he's not trying to guess what's going to make me happy. He's not trying to guess what's going to be the right thing to do. He knows exactly what he needs to do in order to accomplish the goals. And then anything outside of that, I'm all about supporting now because for me, if, if the two things that are important to me get accomplished, everything above and beyond that is just gravy for me. It's just, it's just positive. And as long as it helps support those overall goals, I'm all for it. And so like, it's, not as, it's not as scary as it could have been, but I just didn't allow it to be scary by setting up front the expectations of what was expected of the business in order to do that. And now, like, honestly, like, it's, it's, it's completely independent of me. Like, I give very little direction in day-to-day -day stuff now. Like there's stuff that they're implementing now that I don't, I don't even talk about to them. Like the things I really talk to my CEO about now are vision of, hey, in 10 years, what are we going to do? Hey, what are we doing now? You know, like we're implementing a book club for our employees. We're implementing, you know, like, like uh, we, we just talked this morning about a dream coach, like to talk to our employees about their dreams and how to do that. And that's what I deal with now. And so I don't need to think about the day-to-day -day stuff because I'm not good at that stuff. Like I'm horrible at the accountability and the operations and stuff like that, but I'm really good at like the pie in the sky, like the dreaming as big as possible. And, and, and then my CEO is amazing at implementing those, you know, those plans. So it's, it's not scary when you plan, you know? <laughs> so tell me this, Jordan, what's one thing the audience is, you know, obviously they're going through whatever personal or business challenge. What's one thing they should start doing right now? to get started overcoming their challenges? I would, I would honestly say the very, very first thing to do is stop whatever you're doing, walk to a mirror, and just look yourself in the eye for five minutes. Just look at yourself. Because I mean, I mean, there was times, there was years when I just didn't really look myself in the eye. You know, you'd be in the mirror and you'd brush your teeth and you'd quickly glance over yourself, but to actually like connect with yourself is huge. And, and, and then just ask yourself, or just, you know, just say what I said, you know, I love and accept you. And accept yourself because it, it all starts with you. You know, your, your reality and everything that you do is strictly you. You know, there, you can't go to someone else and ask them advice on what you should do in your life. Yes, I can, you can give pointers, you can do all that stuff, but it's up to your audience or to the individual to take that and actually do something with it. And, and I would say the easiest thing to do is just to start with, I love and accept you. Because with acceptance, you can, you can say, great, now what do I want? Because I accept what I'm, who I am, I can ask for things. And I'm okay with asking for those things because I accept that they're from me and they're mine and they're, they're unique to me. And it doesn't matter what everyone else says, but it's just mine, you know? And, and then start asking yourself, what do you want? And then figure out, well, why do I want that, you know? And then, and then just start asking yourself a lot of questions and, you know, don't be afraid. It, it's super scary, but the, you know, all it is is, all the fear needs is acknowledgement. All the fear needs is to just say, yes, you're there. I understand that that's a scary thing, but you're there and I, I accept that. It's okay to be afraid because it's a human emotion. It's okay to be afraid. It's okay to have those emotions. Now what are you going to do? Move forward, you know, take that step. Do anything. It doesn't, there's, there's no right path. There's no right or wrong in, in this world. It's just your decision to move forward, you know, and, and whatever you do is going to be right. I mean, that's all it is, you know, Every, I, I always tell people they're perfect because they are, you know, I always say like, I, there is no other Jordan Guernsey in this world. There could never be a, as perfect of a Jordan Guernsey as me. I am a snowflake, you know, there's, there's never going to be another Jeremy as perfect as you, you know. Thank you. So everything you did in your life was perfect to get to where you're at now. So stop trying to be perfect. You already are perfect. Now just decide what you want and go towards that. And anything you do is going to get you there. And as long as you're focused on it. So that was kind of a roundabout way to yeah. say, just don't no, say accept yourself. That <laughs> makes sense. And I feel like the first time I would say that, I'd feel a little silly, but, mm -hmm. but kind of accepting where you're at and that you don't accept where you're at, you can't really move forward from that, that point. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see myself the first time doing it being like, what am I doing? You know, yeah. you know, but after that, kind of just realizing really where you're at, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there's only there's only two emotions in this entire world. You know, it's only love and fear, and we're so trained to fear. You know, we live in a fear-based government that if you don't, if you do something, you're going to get punished, or if you don't do something, you're going to get rewarded. You know, versus if we look at everything as love, where it's just just be you, you know, and, and just thrive and, and do what's right for you and, and, and focus on the love. And it sounds so cheesy and it sounds like, you know, it's such a, it's such a weird, you know, we're not supposed to talk about love. We, we can talk about fear and hate and death and, and murder and violence and all that stuff all day, every day. And we can, we can glorify that stuff. But we talk about love and no, 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 we can't talk. It's frou-frou. It's, it's crazy. It's all this, you know, it's all this bad stuff where you shouldn't talk about. But it's just so weird how we were trained to that, that. Once you, it seems silly to love and accept yourself, but once you do that, then it just opens up the world to opportunity and abundance and love and, and freeness, you know what I mean? So tell me this, and I was thinking back to what you said earlier about the, the Rockefeller book and huh? the, you know, being strategic. What's one thing that you've implemented because of, of that that's um, really helped you? We'd say daily rhythm. So there's three things that Rockefeller really, um, really, hit on so it wasn't it, that's the greatest thing about it. it's simple you know there's three things you need to do in business you need to have have your data priorities and rhythm so data is just well so you have your rhythm which is just daily rhythms like what is going on today your priorities what are we working on today and your data how do we know what we're doing is affecting our priorities and that's it I mean, there's nothing else outside of that. I mean, yes, there's, there's the, like, the explanation can be done a lot better. But just those three simple things is all we really implemented. That, and it's changed Molding Box to, it's, it's at a point where literally it's unstoppable. There is nothing that could happen with Molding Box that could stop it right now. Because we're just gaining momentum because we, we have our priorities. We know what we're looking for and what, what, what metrics or what data we're looking at that we know we're getting closer to accomplishing those priorities and then we check up with those every single day and so i think just those simple three things and, and for me personally it's the it's the rhythm it's the daily practices it's the daily just this is this is a non-negotiable you know this is just gonna happen because it's gonna happen and so like for me it's you know for me i do i do in the morning i do my meditation i do my journaling i do you know just just some daily exercise because you know i heard a quote once that goes freely chosen discipline is absolute freedom so once you once you have those disciplines it, it truly is freedom because you're not worried about when am i going to do this you're not worried about any of that stuff so i i think just you know those three things and, and for me personally just the daily rhythms of just keeping on a schedule has been been super beneficial for me so jordan i have one last question before i ask it i just want you to tell us a little bit about more about your business and what you're most excited about that you're working on now um, so molding box is, I mean, it's just awesome. It's just awesome. I, I you know, it, it's a fulfillment company. What we do is that the easiest way to explain it, I would say is if you see an infomercial and it just says plus shipping and handling, we're the shipping and handling guys. So we warehouse people's products, we package them up and we ship them out and, and do all that stuff. One of the things I'm probably most excited about is what, and the things I'm working on myself is like. You know, we're, we have some real estate stuff on the side, but I'm doing, I have this blog, it's chemoblog.wordpress.com, where I've, I've gone through and basically before, it was the week before chemo, I started just recording videos and just talking about my experiences and, and just daily would just go through and just say, well, this is what happened today. I got stabbed by a giant needle. You know, I, I, my heart rate went up to 250 and, you know, this is the way I was feeling emotionally and everything like that. And I've started to actually get a lot of, a lot of, positive feedback from that and I've started to, to inspire a lot of people and I get a lot of comments of you know people saying well you know you're really inspiring and it's great to see the positive attitude and everything like that and that's really I've, I've been spending more time working on that than really molding box and just 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 kind of like honestly just working on myself to go and and talk to people and say well you know this is what I've learned this is what you know I I think life's about and having that perspective I think is is huge you know and so I've, I've really enjoyed kind of building that building the the fan base, you know, me and me and my wife, my family, we're, we went to Haiti just recently and starting to do like real charitable work. And, you know, we're, we've teamed up as a company with a couple of different local programs here to start feeding kids and feeding our, you know, like the, the Utah Food Bank here. We've teamed up with a company out in uh, uh, North Carolina called Stop Hunger Now. And so we're helping to support them to go and, you know, feed kids in Africa and with our Haiti's with the Haiti stuff, it was like, you know, going down there to help build villages for the, the impoverished and the poor. And so like a lot of the, you know, all that stuff, I, I just love that. And that, that's, that really gets me kind of fired up is that, 
that giving back and that service and that, you know, I've, I've been so blessed in my life and I've been able to grow a company to a point where I never have to worry about money again, you know? I, 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 I don't, I, I never work for money. I don't, I don't believe in money. You know, money's just a means to an end. It's just something. I don't want to ever make money. I just want to be justly compensated for the value I create in other people's lives. And, and that's what I'm focusing on is just creating value and, and creating so much value that I get whatever I want. So, you know, it's, I, I think, you know, the, the chemo blog has definitely, definitely been, been my passion. And then, you know, t tying that with the charity aspect and, and getting Molding Box to really switch the focus from, we don't want to make money over there at all. And even a business, it's a for-profit entity, is, its main function isn't money. Its main function is unleashing potential, is finding the way to get our employees to be the best they can be, to finding the way to get our clients to be the best they can possibly be, and honestly, to be a leader and a beacon for good in this world. And that's really what, what the entire focus of, of everything I do. I say my highest goal is to unite and evolve the human race. And so anything I do, as long as it goes towards that, just gets me excited. And that's, that's kind of like the overlying goal. And, you know, the, the minutia right now is like the chemo blogs and the, the donations and the charity work and, you know, building molding box and everything like that. So life just excites me, man. Life's exciting. <laughs> and my, I, I had a last a final question for you. But now huh? that you said this, you, you're talking, it made me think of another one, which is, how, why logistics? Why trans you sound like you should be a motivational speaker. Like, how did you come up with the idea to start this company? I kind of, I kind of just fell into it. It's kind of weird. So my dad, I, I say I was destined to do it. I don't know why, but or what, but like my dad was in the Navy and he was a logistician. I never wanted to do it. But in, when I was like 14, I got a job at, at the, we, we moved to Germany, and I got a job at the post office there, and so I was in the mail. And then I came home, and I went to work for FedEx, and so I, and, and this was like, by no means, I didn't mean to, it's just like, oh, FedEx is cool, I'll go do that. And then from there, I left, went, ended up working with my brother-in-law, um, we started doing some product development. And then in-house, we started shipping out products to people. So it started out with like a prepaid legal pop product. And I was in charge of kind of like the shipping and handling of it. I would I'd go and I'd you know, package everything up and then just go and ship it out. And then from that, it just got to the point where we were doing that in-house. I was in charge of that and a few other kind of responsibilities that the fulfillment just got out of control. And so that's where I just kind of left and stepped away and then started doing the shipping and handling. So it wasn't like I didn't feel like I was called to it. It just kind of like fell into my lap. But... I just fell in love with it. Like I don't, I don't know anyone else that loves the post office as much as I do. <laughs> it's definitely it not. Swirled, I love it. Like I could tell you the shipping method of any carrier to anywhere, and probably you give me a poundage, I can tell you the best way to ship it. And it just, I don't know. Just, it, I just really, I just really love, hmm. love the complexity of getting something from somewhere to somewhere else and and funneling it through and always looking for those efficiencies. But yeah, and then. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I just, I've always loved it. it. It just was fun to do. And, you know, it, and now I, now I think you're right. I, I think I, I could be a motivational speaker, but, you know, I, I, I've, I've always, I, I just like the logistics part of it. I don't know. It was just, it was just fun to do. And I, I fell into it. I never thought I would do it. I never, I never thought that would be, you know, kind of my life calling, but it's, it's really something that I just, I've, I've just really, really enjoyed. And, you know, I, I think it's because I didn't, like I started Molding Box when I was 21, just barely 21, and so I didn't, I wasn't jaded by something. You know, I wasn't told I needed to be a scientist or a doctor or anything like that. And when I got kicked out of high school, like 17, I, I just lived on my own. You know, I, I moved in with my sister and, and basically didn't have any responsibility, didn't have any expectations placed on me. So my, 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 my map was just open, you know, the road to me was just open, so I got to choose what I wanted to do. So I wasn't ever forced to do anything that when I, when I found fulfillment, it just kind of like, it rang true to me. And it was just like, this is awesome. Like, I just do this, I just ship packages and people pay me money for it. Like, people don't understand this stuff and it just, it just kind of happened. So it was, it was awesome. It was really fun. <laughs> so my, my final question was actually, because I, I have no idea, I don't even have a guess, but how did you get kicked out of high school? <laughs> I some girl accused me of doing something that was that was bad, but it it ended up that she was just lying. And and I live in I live in Utah of all places, and so it, it, with the with the stigma of what Utah is out there, it's very true. But I lived in like tiny town Utah, which is like 
very, very true for like the, 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 what are they called? The perceptions that outside people have of Utah. And so it's very close knit. It's very like, you know, very, very LDS as the predominant religion out here. And I just was against the grain. I think that was really more than anything was, I just was against the grain. There was those sort of accusations that kind of came out that, that at the end were really just full lies. Like, you know, the, the people involved fully admitted they just lied, but the administration just was like, well, you know, we, we just aren't comfortable and blah, blah, blah. And, and for me, it was it was sad at that time. But literally, again, the, the best thing that could have happened to me was getting kicked out of school at that time because it really set me on a whole different path. Moved me into a, I moved out of Utah County into Salt Lake County and got to, you know, really got to just, just really figure out life on my own, which was just a, a huge blessing and really made me independent, really made me made me me you know so yeah. here's all no i suggest everyone get kicked out of school no, <laughs> <laughs> um but jordan i want to thank you so much for taking the time i know that you're a minimalist you don't uh cell phone not email your you know skype or anything like that so thanks for taking the time inspiring sure. us and helping us kind of look at that way of how we can overcome some of those personal and business challenges. And I want to be the first one to thank you uh, for your time and, and telling us about that. Of course, man. Thank you so much for reaching out. I'm more than happy to always talk. I, I, I can talk a lot. I like to talk. So once you get me going, it's hard to stop me. <laughs> so I want everyone to go check out Molding Box, check out his chemo blog and just say thank you and uh he's got a lot of great youtube videos so just comment on those too so yeah, jordan thanks so much for your time oh no problem thanks jaren we'll talk to you soon i want to meet the uh the kids oh, the i hear them the whole time so now we got to meet them <laughs> yeah let me grab them really quick hold on Daddy. Daddy, i'll grab you one second i'm gonna grab you so this is Kyle. So cute. <laughs> yeah, buddy. He's Looks like he's up. eating something. Yeah, it's this little like teething thing that he just gets like his entire body will just get messy. So he loves it. Say hi, buddy. Say hi. <laughs> Let me grab my daughter too. So cute. This is Isabel. She's a bigger one. So Say cute. hi, Jeremy. Isabel, how old are you? How old are you? Three. You're three? You're almost four, aren't you? When are you going to be four? Next week? <laughs> She's shy. <laughs> how old's your kid? She's or do you have almost two. Nice, nice. Kids are fun. They're a, they're a blessing, I'd say, sometimes. Sometimes <laughs> I don't want to think about them, but... For the most part. <laughs>